Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the voice of all combat sports, the legend Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how you doing? Good, good. Doing uh, better than the Yankees have been doing recently. They need to win tonight. Uh, Yankees down two to nothing to the Dodgers. Maybe the cold weather uh, here in New York will help the home team. The Dodgers, you know, they got the thin blood. They're used to that warm, mild weather out out west. Maybe that maybe that turned things around. But uh, two to nothing hole that the Yankees are in. They they gotta they gotta win tonight. And um, because it's the only hope for New York. Because the Jets and Giants in football ain't quite getting it done. I mean, how do you have a huge, huge metropolitan area like New York, one of the biggest sports, you know, hubs in the world, and you don't have winning teams? I agree with you. I used to say to everyone, and no offense, I love you, I hate the New York teams, but... I would always say it's unacceptable that New York with their awesome sports fans don't have a winner. They've got three football teams, three hockey teams, baseball. You've got to have winners here. The city's too big and too into the sports to have everyone not be good. I mean, thank God, like you said, thank God for the Yankees. Well, who's the third? Oh, you got Buffalo, right? You're thinking yeah. of Buffalo State. Yeah. yeah, upstate, upstate. Buffalo's good. Buffalo is a good, solid team with a tremendous quarterback, but I tell yeah, you, I like the Jets... Them a lot. The Jets and the Giants, wow. Uh, it's, jeez, uh, wow. Um, I, the Jets, I used to have, I'm surprised the Jets are this bad. At the beginning of the season, they were like, we're all in. We're getting everyone. They just got that kid from um, the Raiders, the uh, the receiver. Yeah, well, um, Rodgers wanted him. Ron, yeah. Rodgers, Rodgers wanted him. Look, Rodgers is 40 years old. He, he lost the whole year last year. You know, you, you don't... It's tough. You're coming back from an Achilles at any age, especially 40, and you miss yeah. a whole year before. It's 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 not easy, no. uh, obviously. So anyway, let's go Yanks, and let's go right into the boxing. We had one, we had one uh, traditional boxing match, and then we had a tremendous card as usual in the UFC. And, of yep. course, uh, a huge headliner that everybody was waiting for. I know uh, I know a few people got pissed off at me because I didn't, <laughs> I didn't preview the Topuria Holland, Holloway fight last week, and I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry because we covered so much stuff that, yeah. quite frankly, I take responsibility for everything here. I, I let it, you know, I let it go... I let it get past me, and I wish I had, because I'm not going to even tell you who I would have picked, because everybody is saying, you're full of crap. <laughs> yeah, come on, you're full of crap. Yeah. We know you would have picked Holloway. Come on, stop, stop, yeah. stop. Yeah. So I'm not even going to go there, Sam. You know what I mean, Sam? You know, you get older, you learn. You learn where to, you know, you learn where to pick your, your bouts. You know what I mean? You pick yep. your scraps here and there. You, you kind of learn from the... Kenny Rogers song, you know when to hold them, when to fold them, you know? And um so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna even play around with that. But good good solid as always fights on the UFC and then uh, an interesting fight. You know, not exciting, but that's set it up. Pro Grace and Catterall. Yeah, like you said, it was a uh <laughs> It would, it would have been hard to pick anyone other than Max Holloway, friend of the show, as is Regis Prograis. So to see them both uh, lose was very difficult on a Saturday back-to-back. Uh, but Regis Prograis in a pretty good fight. I mean, I thought there were moments that were exciting. At times, I thought at the beginning of the fight, they both seemed a little bit tentative. I don't want to say nervous, but... A little bit tentative, Regis chasing uh, chasing Catterall around the ring early, got him down, I think, in the fifth round, and then Regis was down twice in the ninth. Hard to watch Regis kind of fade late in the fight as Catterall seemed to gain huge momentum and start putting on him. Uh, looked like Regis twisted a knee or an ankle. His leg wasn't, like, 
behave in the way it should and that just made him more susceptible he but he said after the fight he just doesn't have the gas tank he could feel himself feel himself faded and you could fading and you could see it in real time and it was like i say it was hard to watch because he's such a nice guy but a uh, good win for jack catterall i love the build up for this fight respectful to each other and respectful before and after the fight good sportsman all around how'd you like the fight yeah big fight over and across the pond you know the english fans are the best i mean we got a lot of good fans in a lot of different you know, countries and nations, but uh, it's hard to beat the English fans. They they come out. They they really support their their blokes. And uh, it was you know it was uh, it was not a scintillating fight. But that's the style of Catterall. Catterall wins fights by getting you to fight his fight. That's always important. Carlos Monzon, one of the greatest middleweight uh, champions of all time, one of the greatest fighters of all time. You know, not a great human being, that's for sure, but um, <laughs> but but a but a great fighter. He would get guys to fight his fight. He was tall, he was long, he would control range, and that is a talent. You know, basketball teams get teams to play their game. Football teams, baseball. You know, you yeah, pitcher controls the mound. You know, gets you where he gets control over the rhythm of the game. And Catterall's that pitcher, that guy. He doesn't throw. He doesn't throw heat. He doesn't throw the ninety miles an hour, hundred mile an hour fastball. But he, he throws the change up, the curveball, the the sinker. You know, he hits the spots. He hits the coin. He's Greg Maddox from years ago, the the great oh, pitcher God, with was the. He good. You know that that had that was so good with the Braves and with the Cubs. Uh, you know, again, no no big fastball, no heater, but knew how to control the the strike zone. And Catterall controls the strike zone. You know, he he. He keeps you up balance. Uh, yeah, you know, some people make fun and say, you know, if you're having trouble with insomnia, watch his fight and all. But if you're if you're a purist of the game and you enjoy counterpunching, you enjoy the sweet science, you enjoy that part of it. There's a lot of ways to bring about the sweet science. The ran was the sweet science. People don't know that. People, Some people say, oh, no, he was just an animal. He was just an aggressive, you know, sick and destroyed destroyer. No, he wasn't. He was a good boxer who happened to be aggressive. <laughs> You know, he had great reflexes, great technique. He made you miss as he was coming forward. Uh, you know, he broke you down with pressure, but he didn't take punches to do it. And Catterall, you know, he, he he goes and he plays the sweet science in his way, uh, using his legs. It, uh, with him, it's all legs and jabs, all legs and jabs. For the most part, for both guys, Progress was legs and jabs, but it was legs coming forward. Catterall, legs going backwards, you know, controlling range, getting you to fall into traps, uh, you know, using defensively, you know, he, 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 he makes himself hard to hit by getting out of range uh, and then hoping to, you know, catch you reaching a little bit. Progress did a good job the first six, seven rounds of closing the gaps where he did it with double jabs, he did it with patience, he didn't get reckless, he didn't, you know, run into, you know, into counters, he didn't make it easy for Catterall to do his thing. He 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 did a good job progress the first six, seven rounds, eight rounds, whatever. Then it started to get away from. Him. Listen, one thing that I was curious about is, yeah, you can say his knee, his ankle, whatever, when he went down on the canvas, but I just feel that he looked bad in the Haney fight. He looked much better in this fight. Uh, but I just wondering if, I always say that, you know, age in boxing is is a funny thing. It's not so much about, you know, the, the chronolo chronological age. It's more about just how many miles you got on the odometer, to be honest. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's like a car. A car could be an old car, but if it's only got, you know, it could be 30 years old, but if it's only got, you know, 10,000 miles on the old dominant, it's not, you know, it's not going to behave like an old car. Uh, a car could be, you know, a newer car, but if it's got 200,000 miles on the old dominant, guess what? It might start to behave like an older car. I, I just, I just have my, I have my thoughts about, uh, Progress his legs okay, 
His legs just, they started to look old. They started to look like they weren't supporting him. They started to look like they were, they were, they were, they weren't under him. They just, they weren't supporting him the right way. And I just he felt. He said after the fight that uh, he's probably going to be done, uh, at least in that weight class, trying to make the weight. But he also said that, to your point, Catterall, of all the guys he's been in with, Catterall's probably the best in his opinion. Yeah, I mean, look, Catero, if you have a problem, you're getting older, it shows up in the legs. I always tell people that. It shows up in the legs. And to me, it was showing up in the legs of pro grace, where maybe he's starting to show some some signs of being a little, you know, again, a little bit shop-worn in certain areas. And he, look, if he struggled with weight, it makes it harder. It makes it only, that that speaks to it. I can understand that. That could make it even harder. That could make it even worse. That could bring it out even more, where you're weakened, uh, making weight. But to me, when you're fighting a guy and your legs might be getting a little bit on the other side, let's say, you know, a little older, and you find a guy that makes you use them, now you're going to start to have a problem. And that was part of it, I think, that he had to use his legs so much to close the gap. Uh, and then he got hurt. He got hurt in the ninth round. He got And look, Caterpillar's not a puncher, but when you're a good counterpuncher, and he's a pure counterpuncher, when you catch guys, you're going to catch them clean. And when you catch anyone clean, you can hurt them. And he caught them clean. He caught them with, you know, from the southpaw position. Uh, he, he caught him. He, he caught him beautifully. He set it up with the jab, blinded him with the jab, and then hit him with the left hand. Both the knockdowns, same hand, left hand, set up by the right hand, by the jab, where he never saw the punch. So that that's going to have an extra effect on you. You don't see it. You don't have time for your brain to register. Hey, get prepared for what's coming. You just get hit, bang. Uh, it, it's hard to handle those kind of punches you don't see. It short circuits the mind. But... Not again, you you catch a guy's clean, you don't have to be a huge puncher. I thought Catero, I, I don't know about those scores. I didn't score the fight. Full disclosure as always. I know Catero won all the late rounds, and he had maybe a 10 7 round in the night because of the two knockdowns 10 8, 10 7, whichever way you go. You know, across the pond, they're going to make it 10 7. You know that. And <laughs> that's automatic. You, you know, you're going to get crumpets with your tee, and you're going you're gonna to get a 10 7 round if, if their guy scores a knockdown. So you got that. But. The early rounds, I thought Prograves was in control of the fight. I thought he got to the point where he was being a boss. He was backing Catero up properly, not reaching in, not getting overextended, you know, not getting over anxious, not giving him opportunities where he could set traps and counter punch. Uh, and then he dropped him in the fifth with a jab. Uh, it was it was one of those funny punches. It was. It, was, it looked like it was more around the neck, a little under the chin, but it was a nice, clean, stiff jab. You know, it dropped him. Uh, Catero, obviously, it was a flash knockdown. But more importantly, Prograce was controlling the rhythm, the pace of the fight. He was backing him up. He was being the man. He was being, as I said earlier, the boss. And then the later part of the fight, all of a sudden, again, changes. Catero, to his credit, he stepped it up. He started moving his hands enough. You know, the the first half of the fight, all he did was jab and use his legs. I mean, he did not he did not move his hands much. He started putting combinations together. He started moving his hands more. He knew he had to. I'm sure that they got that through to him in the corner that even if you're home, you're losing this fight, which I thought he was losing the fight. And then he took control of the fight. I don't know if he won as big as they gave it to him. I didn't score it. I didn't do the math. But at the end of the day, they had him winning pretty, you know, pretty wide. And that means they, I guess, between the the big ninth round and then him taking those late rounds, uh, he caught up and he went ahead. I see him catching up. I see him going ahead. I just don't know if he could have went ahead as many points as they had it but at the end it doesn't matter Catero won the fight there's no arguing that uh again a lot of people will dismiss him as a 
as a guy who's not physically strong, as a guy who's not uh, exciting, get in there with him and and find out if <laughs> that's exactly if right. he's you know find out <laughs> what you think after you get in there with and and you're trying to catch up to him and he's kind of in you and he's changing you know position on you. Uh, he he plays again his greatest strength. Obvious is his legs and his ability. He's got good eyes, his ability to counter. But to get you to fight his fight, he fights the cat and mouse fight. He he likes to make you into the mouse, where the cat plays with the mouse. That That is a perfect description, for me at least, of what Catterall does. You know, he, he, he gets you chasing him, you know, and then he next thing he slaps you around a little bit, then he moves again, then he plays with you. You know, he he wants to turn it into that kind of cat and mouse game. And the funny part about that game, it wasn't going his way the first seven rounds. It was more like a dog and cat fight, where I was starting to think that Progres was the dog, Catterall, Gatto, actually his nickname, right? The cat, yeah. was, was the cat. And the dog was looking, as I've often said, to eat the cat. And it looked like he might have a chance to eat the cat. You know, he had dropped him in the fifth. He was backing him up. He was, you know, he was he was feeling confident. It looked like, again, the flow of the fight was going pro Grace's way. And he was, you know, the cat was clawing, scratching, moving, staying away, trying not to get eaten by the dog. And then, you know, all of a sudden, what happened? The dog, uh, the dog ate a bad bone. You know, and uh, he started, you know, he had a problem. He's, he he got caught. He The whole fight turned around. Even before he got caught in the ninth, uh, Pro Gray started, just started to slow down. And again, Catterall, to his credit, stepped it up, started moving the hands. You can't win a fight no matter what your style is if you don't move your hands. He started moving his hands a little bit more. At the end of the day, Catterall gets... Gets his kind of fight again, the kind of fight that he wants. Um, I, 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 I'll throw this at you. Um, you know, he's when you're over there across the pond, and Eddie Hearns, your promoter, or Frank Warren, they do tremendous jobs over there, both of them. You're gonna, you know, you're gonna make a lot of money, and you're gonna, you're gonna be able to pick your spots a little bit, and um, you know, I, I think that. Uh, they're gonna have a, you know, they're gonna pick their spots. They're gonna. I think the matchmaking is always important. I think when you have a guy that's got such a definitive, specific style like Catterall, where his talents are all in one, in one bag, so to speak, that you count that you, your matchmaking has to be on the button. It has to be. Somebody mentioned to me, why don't he fight Tank Davis? Uh, you know, that Tank Davis, and then someone said, well, Tank Davis would have to move up to 140. You know, that wouldn't be good. What do you mean wouldn't be good? I, I would have no problem seeing Tank Davis, and I'm not knocking Catterall, but for me, Tank Davis could easily move up, if he wanted to, could easily move up to 140. And, I mean, that guy knows, if Progress could close the gap for six, seven rounds, you're going to tell me that, you're, you're really going to make an argument that Tank Davis couldn't close the gap? And then when he closed the gap and he landed, that his punches wouldn't have a lot more effect than Progress's punches at this point in his career? You're going to tell me that? No, don't tell me that. Go go tell that to somebody else that might believe you. <laughs> so anyway, at the end of the day, uh, you know, they're, they're in the catbird seat. Uh, again, not a pun on words, not meant to be a pun because of his nickname, but they're in the catbird seat in a way that they're over there. Uh, they they can pick their spots and 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 look to you know look to see what makes the most sense for them. Yeah. All right, let's jump over to the UFC. We'll start with um, Ankalaev again, Magomed Ankalaev and Alexander Rakic. Um, 
Interesting fight. Not the most exciting, I don't think. Uh, unanimous decision for Ankalaev. Um, very close. 29-28 on all three score scorecards. So one round, one round difference. Um, I don't know. Interesting fight. I'm curious to hear what you thought of it because uh, it was very technical at times. Two solid guys, baby. Just two sure. really solid, solid, good, solid fight. Both of those uh, guys are the kind of guy like you don't want to see on the other side of the cage. Like they, especially Rockich, I think he's super awkward. At least by all accounts, that's what people well, say think, about him. But curious what you think. I think he played it smart. I thought he fought a good fight. Both guys. I thought Rockich um, played it very smart. Moved, used his legs, stayed on the outside, tried to keep the strong Ankalaya off balance. Try to keep him from getting set. You know, guys that are strong need to be set. You need to be have your feet under you. He was trying to keep Ankalaya from getting his feet under him. Ankalaya switches really well back and forth from Southport to Orthodox. Did a good job with that. I thought they both did a great job trying to control the geography that made sense for them. Rajat's on the outside, Akalayev getting in close. And again, just like I said about progress early, not getting reckless, not reaching, gradually, cautiously, you know, patiently being aggressive. Uh, the proper way, behind the jab, taking steps, making sure he was balanced, making sure his legs were under him, making sure that he wasn't out of position, that he wasn't going to make himself vulnerable to any counter shots or anything from, from Rakic, um, did not reach. Uh, Rakic looked like the bigger guy. Here's a funny thing. I, I always tell you how I feel, even if it sounds weird. Rakic looked bigger to me. And then by the time we got to the third round, he didn't look bigger no more. I, I, it's just, it's like, wow, Ekaliyev did look bigger because he was the guy that was t starting to just do his thing, you know, starting to take control. Still close fight, uh, very competitive. I thought Ekaliyev won it, but uh, nice competitive fight. Uh, Ekaliyev, uh, like I said, just gradually closed the gap without getting reckless, never off balance. Uh, I thought, you know, I, I thought uh, second round, I thought the second round was uh, Ankalaev, again, was pressing. Rockets still controlling range, uh, moving, picking spots. Uh, and that's about when I thought, when Ankalaev was starting to, you know, have to obviously get in and and get closer that's what I thought he just, again, it, it's weird. It's just like, he looked like the bigger guy suddenly. Like, And I noticed how much bigger Rakic was initially. And I, I even thought to myself, wow, you, 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 now you're seeing this guy look bigger. It's, so second round, uh, Ankalaev closing the gap, landing the left hand. Uh, he did most of his work with the left hand, body and head, uh, from the southpaw position. Uh Again, very steady, very straight. It was a striking fight, you know, for the most part. Uh, straight left hands, as I said, body and head, and pressure by Ankalaev. I, I thought it was either 2 nothing after 2 or 1-1. One, 2-0 one. Two for Ankalaev or 1-1. One, one. Um, but just a steady, cautious pressure all night from Ankalaev. Uh, you know, it, it, it eventually is, it eventually pays dividends. And the reason why it pays dividends for a guy like Ankalaev is he's doing it smart. He's not doing it while he's taking a lot. I mean, that, that, that is, that is the key, obviously. Um, so looking at my notes here, uh, one thing that I noticed that, that he did, he didn't get credit for it, but I thought that. Ekalayev does a great job. He's not just a strong guy. He knows what he's doing. As he was landing the left hand from the south pole position, he was doing something that I teach in the gym. From the south pole position, he was setting it up really smart. Really, really, really smart. He, he was slipping his head over here, and as he slipped it over, he simultaneously, little delay, he would throw the left hand down the middle. So what he does is, because you have to have a delivery system. I don't care how good a punch you are. You have to have a trick to get it to the target, a way to get it to the target. And his way was, again, to, 
to distract, to, to, to set up, you know, Ratchet by moving his head to the right, suggesting something's going to be coming from that side, when in fact it was going to come from the left side. And then he throws the left. Slip to the right, throws the straight left hand. He landed a nice left hand that way a couple times. Um, third round, uh, only round that they started to grapple a little bit in close, you know, not really getting to the floor, but up against the fence, uh, up against the cage, uh, you know, they started to do that a little bit. Close third round, edge to Ankalaev. Again, solid fight by two solid pros. The judges had it 29-28, 29-20. So I guess they probably had it the way I had it. You know, 1-1, uh, one, one, they, they must have had it 1-1 one, one after two, and then obviously Ankalaev got the last round, and they, they wound up having it 3-2. to two. Um, and like I said, I, I could have had it 1-1. I could have possibly had Antoliev winning uh, the second two, but I thought it was right to, to have it 1-1 after two. So, and then, of course, we get to this uh, the sensational guy that's taken, you know, there's so many sensational guys in UFC. I was going to say taking the UFC by storm, but there's so many guys that are ready to get that storm you know, that star on them, that, that are waiting to get marked with that star, to be the star, you know, for because of their sensationalism in, in one way or the other, whether it's with sheer power on the floor or whether it's sheer power knockout standing or their ability to kick or, or a mixture of, that, of everything. But everybody, there's so many guys now looking to go to the front of the line in the UFC that you really, it's like being in a candy store. You can have your picket, like who who's your guy? Who's your goat? Who's your, you know, who's your pound for pound? You know, speaking of goats coming up, you know, in a few weeks, you got John Jones, of course, uh, with me, Orchik. I'm going to be there at the garden uh, at that fight, you know, working for ESPN with all the great people over there. But, they they were just so, again, just so many guys. And so many of the guys that are coming from a certain region of the world, where Khabib came from, where they're just, they're, they're, they're unbelievable wrestlers, they're unbelievable grapplers, they're unbelievably strong. And when I say unbelievably strong, I'm not saying just unbelievably strong physically. I mean mentally. Like they're bred. Especially they're bred. mentally. They're, they're, yeah, they're bred to be warriors. They're bred for this. They're bred to fight. You know, they're brought up for the uh, with a code of honor, a code of, you know, behavior. Again, as a, as a warrior. So the guy we're talking about is Magomedov that I'm talking about. Yep. And um, I don't think... Petrosian gets enough credit. I know he's 9-3. Magomedov was 14-0, and 0, but uh, Petrosian was fighting a good fight. Until. It was a very good fight. Back until. And forth, good action. Until. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's every day. Every time you watch the UFC, too, you might be treated to something you've never seen before. And I'd never seen that. And a lot of people have. And I was listening to Rogan covering the, uh, commenting on the fight live on his, on a podcast he does during the um, thing. And he said he'd never seen anyone do that either. And along with all the guys watching, it was uh, it was wild. He stood his spinning back fist, uh, clipped him. Double, double, and, double, and then double. And immediately reversed with the other hand and came whipping around, knocked him out cold. Crazy, crazy athleticism. But the timing have, of it, too. The timing. Like and you would say. See, little things. Like you would say the, the staying calm in an uncalm environment to have the mindset and the and the intellect to be able to spin with that other fist and land it was crazy. You're not going to shoot anyone, are you? I just saw something. Oh, you had, uh, <laughs> no, sorry. Uh, don't, gotta, don't, please, that's, please. That's a lighter. <laughs> oh, okay, good. You know what? Uh, I, it's funny you said that I had this lighter as a joke with the kids for my Halloween costume, and I was holding it the other day, and someone said, do you have a gun in your hand? I'm like, oh, no, I'm sorry. It's a lighter. <laughs> I forgot it was there. <laughs> Listen, I'm glad to hear that. Um, don't light anyone up. <laughs> you know... I, the guy, one word for Michael Magdorf, and there's a few of them again that are in the UFC, but it, explosive, explosive, explosive. He's like a bowed up bundle of TNT, you know, waiting to explode. Just, just, you know, 
bouncing around, quick twitch, you know, with those explosive fibers bouncing around, you just waiting to explode. And he got a chance. But it, the little subtle things that that he did to set it up, he, he faked his leg coming up. He faked his yeah. leg coming up. People, I mean, did we miss that? He faked his leg coming <laughs> up, you know, just to make the guy think, okay, you know, something below. When it's coming above, smart. Smart monsters. Yeah, there are monsters, but they're smart monsters. And he picks his knee up a little bit like this, and then all of a sudden he, he throws the, the, the throw away. The first one was just a setup. It wasn't meant to land. It was meant to get him to block it. And he did. He blocked it. But the problem was after he blocked it, he thought that was it. And then what happens? Petrosian starts to throw his own right hand. You know, because you block, what do you do? You catch and shoot. So you're taught to catch and shoot because it's not too often you get a double backhand, right? So he blocked, and then he's looking to shoot. And when he's looking to shoot the counter, which is what fighters do, they come right back with their own, the, the second back fist was on its way already. And it caught him in midstream. It beat him. I hope Rob puts it up because I wanted to put a replay of it up. But it caught him. He, he, he catches it. The first one gets him to block. That's what he wanted him to do. He wanted him to block. He wanted him to, to think that he, did the, he, he got away from the danger. When the real danger was still coming. Still to come. It was this setup. It was this setup. It was the hunter. The hunter out there, you know, that, that shoots a, a throwaway shot. To, to move the prey the other way, where he wants to move it, where he wants it to go. So now he's waiting when it comes out of that little, that little spot. Bang! He moved him there. He wanted him to go there. And that's ingenious. That, that's being common and uncommon violence. That's thinking. That's not just being physical and explosive. That's using your physicality because you're smart, because you're able to think under pressure. You're cerebral. And, and I want to always give these guys credit for that. Those are the ones that separate themselves. And Petrosian was fighting a good fight, a, a, a good competitive, tough, solid fight. But he, he got hit with something that, that's unusual, that was very creative, that was really well, well executed. Again, he, he throws the first backhand, you know, uh, just, just to set him up, just to get him to block thinking that, okay, I did what I had to do. No, you're not done, unfortunately. You start to come back, bang. The other one was right there, right there. It caught him, I don't know if it caught him with the elbow or it caught him with the forearm. I don't think it was the fist. I think it was either the forearm or possibly the elbow. Whatever it was, doesn't matter. It did the job. And um, at, at the end of the day, just, and again, I hope Rob got it up, uh, but... And you can follow what I'm saying as you watch the replay. You, know, you can see and just appreciate that it's not just quick twitch. It's not just, you know, explosiveness. It's not just beautiful, God-given talent, genetic talent. It's him using his head to use that talent in the most appropriate, efficient, effective way. And that's what separates the great ones for the other ones that are very talented too, but they don't put it together with the stuff up top. So anyway, that, that covers that, I think, really well. Very explosive. Uh, uh, you know, obviously a guy you want to a guy you want to follow. Dangerous guy. Dangerous guy. Very. In the um, co-main, Bobby Knuckles, Robert Whitaker in against Kamzat Shamaev and... Uh, you got to feel My bad. God. Whitaker is a great guy, Terrible. great, great champ, humble, been a great champion, uh, uh, like a, a, a legendary guy, just just a great, solid fighter and, and a great person as far as we could see, the way he conducts himself. And uh, he just ran into one of those forces of nature, um, generational talents, whatever you want to call it. It Go ahead. Me of, uh, it reminds me of Shemaev reminds me of like a Tasmanian devil. He just came out like a literally like a like like a little tornado in the dust and just. Well, he knows what he is. 
He knows yeah, what he is. He came out like a freaking house on fire. Got Bobby Knuckles down, and here's the interesting part. He got him in like a cross face, kind of had him in going for a rear naked, got the arm, forearm across his jaw, and literally either he pushed all the teeth, his lower teeth, way back into his mouth, but I think that he broke a part of the jaw off because Bobby Whitaker tapped instantly so that everyone watching the fight, everyone thought the same thing, like, whoa, that was a quick tap. He didn't even have the choke in. But apparently he pushed all his teeth and his jawbone back into his mouth. And, uh, you know, needless to say, I'm sure that startled uh, Whitaker and he tapped immediately. And, uh, man, Bobby Whitaker's tough. He just got up and was like, yeah, but these teeth have been a vulnerability for a while. I'm going to have to get them fixed now. And uh, first round submission for Shamayev. What would you think of it while it lasted? First of all, when I say things... I'd say him specifically for a reason. Even a stupid thing like, oh, he knew what he wanted to do. Yeah, it sounds, uh, no kidding, Ted. But what I mean by that is, he knows what he is. He knows what he can do. He's fully confident with what he can do. And he wanted to get to the floor. He wasted no time, no time giving his greeting card. Hello, I'm a guy. This is me. I'm Shemayev. I take you to the floor. <laughs> And he he immediately shot the legs, got him to the floor because that's what he wants to do. And he immediately got right there. Um, no, you know, he shot low. He got no striking, nothing, bang, right to the floor. And again, the same thing. To just say how strong Shemaev is, is not fair. Because that's obvious. But how smart, how fast. Oh, my goodness. How fast he, he moved on the mount. He, he, he flipped around. He, you know, he tumbled over. He, went, he switched sides. He, he did whatever he had to do strategically with good technique, brilliant technique, brilliant instincts. Whitaker moved this way, he moved that way. Whitaker moved this way, he moved that. Whitaker, he didn't know which way to move. Because this guy's that good. Forget about how strong he is. We get it. But he's that fast. He's that good. <laughs> he's that solid. He's that technical. He's incredible. Incredible. He's a monster again. A smart monster. He got... And we always want to be correct. Um, and to your point, you, you know, said you think he broke a piece of his jaw off. From all reports that I've gotten... His jaw is fine. I, unbelievable. I mean, because you would have thought what Ken just said. You would have thought, yeah, his jaw is broken in 10 pieces. But the teeth were the problem. From everything I read <clears throat> and everything I got, I made a few phone calls. The thing was that his teeth moved. He's had a problem with his teeth in the past. He makes no excuses, Whitaker. He's had a problem with his teeth, whatever. Um, they, they sit a certain way. Well, now they sit a whole different way they don't sit they will move back and he's already talking he's already feeling better uh obviously his you know he's personally his pride is hurt he's a proud guy he's a you know he's a warrior but uh you know he got beat by a special guy i can report that he's out of surgery just had his teeth surgically uh repaired yeah, jaw's okay though, right? It, just the teeth. Yeah, I think you're right. Maybe they just when I saw the picture, it looked like half of his jaw was like under his tongue, but it was all his teeth pushed yeah. in there. The report that I got was up. everything is done. He's he's actually like pretty good, you know, considering. I mean, his teeth had to be uh, fixed, of course, uh, and dealt with, but his jaw is intact. His jaw is okay. But what this guy did, he didn't even get a clean to what you were trying to say, Ken. He didn't get under his chin. He That's he got right. on top of his chin. I mean, like he, he was- crank. He was yeah, yeah, it was like putting someone's face in a vice. And yeah, and, and that's right. Really. And you and you and you close the vice, what's gonna happen? The face is gonna crack. You know, the face is gonna break. And that's kind of what it 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 looked like. Like his like his his face collapsed, like his jaw collapsed. But of course it was mostly the teeth and we're grateful for that. We're grateful that the jaw didn't have to be wired up and, and he didn't have to go through the surgery of the jaw and all that stuff. Um yeah. but he 
just, again, not only the sheer, sheer, sheer power and will of the of Shemayev, but how quickly he he got there, how quickly he got position, how he wrangled for the right position, and how he just dominated. And and again, he once he wrapped his, he was like a boa constrictor. You know, a boa constrictor wraps around you. You're done. You're done. Uh, it's it's going to squeeze you to this this nothing there. And and that's pretty much. I think that pretty much covers uh, what that you know what that fight was. And the only thing we didn't know was it was a prelude. <laughs> I mean, he beat a great fighter and he oh. dominated him. Whitaker but it was a prelude. It was a prelude to another great fighter, an iconic fighter, a legendary fighter, getting not beaten, but again, dominated. I think that's the thing that got everyone. Like, yeah, nobody, a lot of people might not have been shocked that Shemayev won, but to win that way against Bobby Whitaker, to win right. that way. And I think the same thing in the next fight, the main event that we're about to get to. The same that's why I say it was like a prelude to that. Because yeah, you 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 might have thought that, you know, Topuri was gonna win if you thought that, or you might have thought Holloway was gonna win. Either way, you could make an argument. But nobody, nobody other than Topuria thought that he was going to, just like you didn't think Shemayev could dominate the way he did so quickly. You didn't think, I, I'd be shocked if you thought that Topuria could dominate a great, great, great fighter the way he wound up doing. So go ahead, set it up. Yeah, to, to your point, stand up, fight all night long, um, and Ilya Topuria just put it on Max Holloway, finally knocking him out. I think the first time Max has ever been knocked out, it was... Uh, first time he's yeah. ever been knocked down, Ken. Not knocked out, oh, really? down. He's, he's never <laughs> so been off, the, off his feet. And to your point, to see him get dominated like that was uh, kind of sad to see. Good for Taporia, new champion, new breed. But, man, to see a guy of Max's uh, caliber get dominated like that, do you think... That it was that Max is just getting old right in front of him. He's been around a long time. He's got a lot of miles on the abdominal. Or you think it's a combination of the age and Taporia just being that good? I think Taporia, I'm taking nothing away from this guy. Max wouldn't want me to. I know Max. He's a gentleman. He's been on our show. He's a great human being. He's a great, great role model. He's a great champion. He wouldn't want it any other. No. I'm going to say, yeah, he's 32 years old. Yeah, he's 26 and 7 years. He's been in a lot of tough fights. A lot of tough fights. Miles on the old domino. All of that for Max Holloway. Taporia is 15 and 0. He's 27 years old. Again, Max is 32 years old. But... No, I think it was just Topuria being that good, being that good, because Holloway didn't show any signs in his fight before this when he was unbelievable, when he won the BMF belt. He didn't show, he didn't show any signs against a really good fighter. He didn't show any signs in his last fight of aging or, or legs going or anything like that, and he didn't show it in this fight. He was having a good, you know, he lost the first round, the second round. He, I thought he won. Uh, it was close uh, where Holloway was getting, we knew he had to win on the outside. Holloway had to control the geography <laughs> on the outside, use his height, use his reach, that length that he has, that jab that he has, those legs that he has, to box brilliantly, to control distance. That's what he had to do. Topuria had to close the gap. But he had to do it again. He had to do it without leaving himself open to counters. He had to do it where, you know, he he wasn't available. And that's what makes him so good. It's the technique. Yeah, it's his talent. Yeah, it's his, he can punch. All of that. But he covers up real well to Puria. When he's aggressive, he's covered. He's moving his head. He's bringing his legs with him. <laughs> he's using his jab to close the gap. He's putting bugs on the windshield, making it hard for you to, you know, to see him coming in, making it, you know, blurring your vision on the windshield a little bit so you can't get a, uh, a real bead on him coming in. He, he, he's making sure he's not out of position. And yeah, he can punch. You know why? Because he's got his legs under him. When he delivered those punches, his legs were under him. He wasn't reaching. And you know what he did? He was smart. Little things. 
He went for a takedown. He's good on the floor too. He's so rounded. But he went for a takedown. They're both great strikers. And that's what it was. But he went for a takedown. Why? Yeah, he's well-rounded. Maybe he's got the edge here. But why? He also was is a great striker. He did it to keep Max thinking. To make him just to think a little bit that he had to think about that. If he's got to think about that, that he might go for his legs, now it might make it a little easier... <laughs> for him to be able to get inside on Max striking. If he's got Max thinking every once in a while, every once in a while, just put a little seed in his head, a little seed of doubt, whatever you want to call it. Max doesn't have doubt. He's, he's beyond that. But, but just put in his head that I, I got to be aware that he might come low. And if you're aware that he might come low, it's making it easier for him now to come at you in the way that he intends to come at you, which is in a striking way, high, coming forward. And I thought that was part of his his strategy, part of the plan. I didn't think it was just done. I thought it was done in a very strategic, thought-out way. And then another thing. He, being Topuria right now, he understood, he, he sized it up. He understood strengths and weaknesses. All right, the guy's strength is he's, he's a, got a terrific chin. We know that. He's got a great jab, great legs, controls range really, boxes really well, puts punches together, Max, really well, controls the outside, uses his height really well. What do I got to do? Wait a minute. What do I got to do? I talk about this all the time. When you got a tall guy, when he's on the outside, he's got a edge he knows how to fight tall which max does he's got an edge he can hit you before you can hit him he's tall he's long if he if he stays consistent with discipline of his geography where he stays in his domain he can give you he's he's given himself every advantage to have the upper hand to win a fight so what does Topuria think Tapiri says, wait a minute, he's tall, he's long, but if I can close the gap, well, there's do's and don'ts. I must make sure I don't get reckless or sloppy or anxious closing the gap. Number one, bang, check box. Number one, okay, bring my legs. C- gradually put pressure on. Come in behind jab, close gap. Cautiously, aggressively. Check. Number two. Once I do start to close the gap, now I have an advantage where I have a guy who is tall, who is long, who is up. There's a target up there. He is straight up. I can hit that target. I can catch that target. And another thing. Yeah, he uses his legs. But if I can apply pressure properly, I can force him to use his legs in a way where he goes in a predictable direction, back. (coughs) And if I can force him to go back, which was his plan from the beginning. It's like I could look right into his brain and see what he was thinking. He's putting pressure on to force him to stand up, to force Max to go back. And if I can get him to go back, he's predictable. And if I can close the gap just at the right time as he goes back, I can catch him standing tall and on a straight line. And what did he hurt him with the first punch? The right hand. How did he catch him? Going back. Over the jab. And how do you take away somebody's jab? Yeah, he's got a great jab, Max. Great. You take it away by countering with right hands over the jab. If you can get close enough, where you can throw the right hand over that jab. The jab, as great as it is, it can be a dangerous weapon for the guy throwing it because it leaves a door, a portal, a window open for the other guy's right hand. The jab comes, bang! The right hand can come right over, right through that door. And that's exactly what a smart, not just a talented, but a calm with good vision, good eyes, calm in an uncommon environment. That's what he can do. And that's what Topuria did. That's his greatness. That's all of it. 
It's not just one part. So what did he do? He applied pressure. He got Max to go back. Knows he could get him to go straight back. Max sometimes goes straight back. Yeah, he breaks it off to the side, but sometimes a little late. <clears throat> he knew he could get him to go back straight far enough, enough of a distance where he could close the gap while he was still there and hit him with the right hand. And then he would throw the jab, and as he jabbed, he would throw the right hand right through that window right through that opening that the jab would create. That's exactly what he did. Pressure, got him to back up, closed the gap, closed the gap, Max threw it, went back, bang, right hand, hurt him, went back, then he went in for the finish. And when he went in for the finish, what did he finish him with? The other hand. Because he, he knew that now I can go to the other hand because he won't look for the other hand as much. And what does Max do? Again, he exploited the strengths of Max. He turned it into a weakness, the height, the standing straight up. He exploited that. Max pulled away. He was hurt, but he pulled away with his hands out to get away. And as he pulled away, what did Topuria do? Step to him. Again, good form. Legs under him. Power. Short, compact left hook from the shoulders. That's where his power comes from, right here. Boom. Short, compact. Not an arm punch. Here. Boom. Left hook. Night over. Night over. And there's one other thing. Big thing. Big thing. And it's something that Patty the Batty, who another guy's been on our show, another guy looking to be that next star, you know, with a lot of talent, right? Um, you know, a lot of talent. And... But Patty the Batty, he's already been in a couple of tough fights, and the the day's coming. You're in the UFC. That day's coming. That day's coming. That 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 next monster is 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 only a short period away. If it's not today, it'll be tomorrow. That's all you got in this league. That's all you got in this 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 this, this sport, this this uh, organization. And what does Patty the Batty do? That when he was on our show, I talked about it. he keeps his chin up in the air too much. What yep. did Tapuria do? Kept it tucked in. Kept it tucked in. What did Max do? Max is great. Great. He don't need Teddy Atlas to do anything. I love you, Max. But he keeps his chin up. And he gets away because he sees everything. He's got a great constitution, a great chin. And usually, you know, he keeps his chin out of, you know, harm's way for the most part by using his legs, using his jab, using his length. But all of a sudden, that was taken away. And now his chin up in the air, like the old times would say, a lantern in a storm. His chin up in the air. And it became an easy target, a solid target, too solid for a puncher like Topuria. And that's it. That's all she wrote. That was it. That, I think that's the breakdown. I mean, the first round, again, I made my notes, but I think I gave it to you. You know, Holloway, uh, again, Topuria patiently used the jab to close. And and I love the way Topuria's feet are quick to close the gap. He reminded me of a young Manny Pacquiao, where his feet, his feet are quick. Quick, boom! He closes the gap. When the opening's there, he closes the gap, and his legs are under him, balanced. Like I said, the top is set because the bottom is set. You know, you got a lot of these guys that reach and their 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 upper body gets ahead of their lower body. Not him, not him. He does it. He's got good trainers. He's got good people, just like Max does. But but it shows. Uh, early, like I said, he went for an early takedown. I I talked about that early on. To appear in town, um, technically solid. Uh, uh, all of that. Uh, one nothing to Puria. I just want to make sure I got it right. Uh, good low leg kick by Tripuria to some nice good low leg kicks. Uh, he did he did a good job with that. Again, if Max is going to beat you, he's going to use his legs, right? He's going to control yep. range. He's going to box. What do you want to do? You want to take his legs away. You go and kick his legs. That's one way of taking the legs away. Yeah, after after the second round, I had it one one. I I could have made an argument for two nothing. Um, but 
two nothing would have been for Tripuria, but I thought Tripuria, I thought Holloway to second round. So I had it one one going into the third, and then of course the third round was it. That's it. That's it. I think that I I think we covered everything well. Um, I am not going to. Uh, I'm not going to be. I'm not going to be yelled at by anybody saying, "Ah, oh, you didn't." Uh, you didn't preview a fight, Teddy, you know? Oh, hold on, hold the- on. I'm going to get to that. I just wanted to tell everyone as a service to our listeners, I want to tell you about our number one supplement, something that I take every day and have done for many years. It's Athletic Greens. Athletic Greens is the all-in-one green drink. One scoop in the morning mixed with your favorite beverage. I use water and you're good to go. It's an insurance policy for your body's health and immune system. Uh, developed with the help of a bunch of different doctors, nutritionists. They really put a lot of work into this, and it is an awesome product. I use this seriously every day. I used it long before they ever worked with us. But athleticgreens.com slash atlas to take advantage of the offer. They're given to our listeners 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. And as you know, you probably need these. You need your vitamins more when you're traveling than when you're at home because your body can get susceptible to the changes in time zones and changing your circadian rhythm. Keep your supplement routine steady <coughs> and uh, stay on the routine. Athleticgreens.com slash Atlas for 10 free travel packs just for our listeners. Please support the sponsors of the show. Let's get into a preview, Teddy. Oshaki Foster getting a second chance against Robson, Robson Kansesau. What are you looking for? And does Oshaki have a chance to right this wrong? Well, the first thing I want to do is say that everybody was up in arms. You know, Robson Kansesau, first of all, you're not human if you didn't at least feel good for him. It was his third try. He's getting old. It was his third try at at the apple. It was his third bite at the apple for the world title. He lost two previous ones. And the third was the charm. They gave the decision over the champion, Oshaki Forster, Robson, Conseco. uh, Very controversial. Everyone was up and raw. Oh, what a robbery. The words, robbery. Listen. It wasn't the worst robbery. For me, did he technically win Foster? You make an argument that he technically won that fight? He won. Sure. No, okay. No problem. You want it? No problem. But to say it was the Briggs robbery, the robbery of the century, when we've seen, when I've seen, I, I, I've seen robberies. I've seen robberies over the years, Friday night fights, everything else. I've seen them. This was not that. It was not that. You know what this was? This was Styles. This was Styles clashing. This was Forster, shaking Forster. He changed his style, I guess, for this night. He fought a very, very definitive, <laughs> careful, defensive, sharpshooting, sniper-type fight where he was controlling the outside, didn't waste anything, looking for counters, looking for perfect spots, not throwing anything extra, just doing enough to win rounds. Uh, again, being very careful, very smart, control range, defensive-minded, and Conseco was busier. Sometimes when you fight that kind of fight, you can get out hustled. It happens. You could get out hustled. The guy presses the issue a little bit. Uh, you know, he's aggressive. Uh, you know, he, he's throwing more. Yeah, it's not landing clean, but you're not landing a lot either. Yeah, the cleaner, more precise punches was it Forster. Yeah, I, I'd have to go back and look at it again, but yeah. Yeah, I'm going to say yeah. But not to the extent that he was just manhandling him. To the extent where, yeah, he was ahead in the rounds, but kept them close enough by not doing that much, forced to be in the guy I'm talking about, not doing anything extra. And by not doing anything extra, not separating himself, he's allowing Conseco to work, to close gaps, to make rounds close, to steal some rounds maybe, with a, with a, with a flourish at the end of a round. 
Where around was a boring round, not much going on, not a much to say. All of a sudden, he can steal around here, steal around there. Again, you're forced to the concise boxer, the prettier boxer, the guy that, you know, the, the sweet science teaching you how to control range, how to set up sharp shooting, you know, accurate punches, all of that. But it was a door left open for Robson Conseco in his third try at the apple, his third bite at the apple to sneak in there, to grab, to steal, to out-hustle. And I thought that at the end of the day, I thought I understood what he did. I said, yeah, I I, I can see people are going to say that, you know, because when you watch Forster, you, it was easier to, to see that he's keeping space. What he does, you could see it. The other guy, you know, he was doing everything like like Rembrandt, like like perfect, like an artist with perfect strokes. Bah, bah. You know, and you could recognize that. You could appreciate that. Bah, 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 bah. You know, the other guy was like a graffiti artist, Ken. You know what I mean? He came in there spray paint. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know a little bit. And then at the end of the day, what? A graffiti artist can't do art too? Yeah, sometimes he can. Yeah. So at the end of the day, yeah, I thought uh, I thought it wasn't quite the, the robbery that everyone made it, but here's the rematch. Who do I like? I think that I like Forster to win this one. Conseco, I think, got his thing. I, I'm not going to say he's going to be fat in the stomach. I'm not going to say he's going to be satisfied, but he got he finally got his title. I'm glad for him as a human being. I'm happy for him that he got the title. Um, I'm not happy if the other guy got robbed. I'm not happy for that. But Forster got the rematch right away. You, you, you got to be grateful for that. He got the rematch yeah. right away. He's younger. I think Conseco's older. I think that he will he will probably not be quite as good as he was that fight he would maybe get a maybe the age will show a little bit more and force to being a little younger that will show and at the end of the day i think forster will learn from his mistakes now people will say what mistakes he got robbed ted he could have done more he left some stuff on the table he could have jabbed more. He could have, you know, I always talk about how you, you set the table with the jab, you eat with the right hand. He could have ate more. He could have ate more. He could have done He could have done a little more. I think he will do a little more. I'm not saying he's got to get reckless. I'm not saying he's got to get out of his ID, if you will, his, his identity of that he wants to box and he wants to do all those great, pretty things. But do a little more of them. When there's opportunities to move your hands a little bit more, move your hands a little more without getting reckless, without betraying your style, without betraying yourself, without being irresponsible. I think he will do a little more. I think the other guy has been, like I said, he got to the mountaintop. I think he's, uh, I hate to say he's satisfied, but I, I think that will be his one shot at the mountaintop. I think that Oshanky Forster will will wind up winning a uh Winning a decision. Unanimous. Not not split this time or whatever it was. Interesting. I'm just looking real quick to see if my bookie has a line on the fight. Um, so, oh, yeah. All right, here we go. Oshaki Foster, minus 429. Robson can say so, plus 285. Over under, 10 and a half rounds, minus 450 on the over. Plus 290 on the under. Looking like a decision, at least as far as the bookies are concerned. So you were right on the money with your uh, prediction. That's what the uh, odds makers seem to think. Oshaki Foster by decision, if you play and put any credence in what the lines odds makers have to say. Yeah, the, and look, does he's the got... the line affect your view? No, no, it don't. Uh, look, I, I don't want to lay 400, to be honest right, with you. Here, I got a better one for you. Sh oh, Shockey Foster, by decision, minus 176. Yeah, I would go that route. I mean, 
you know, he uh, anything could happen. The other guy's getting a little older. Maybe he does catch him a perfect shot. He stops him, and then you don't win. But, yeah, I, I, I don't want to lay for something, to be honest. But I do think that Oshaki forced to win the fight, and I think he's got something else going for him. I think he's got all this bad pub that the judges got. You know, he got the rematch fast. Why did he get the rematch fast? Because they said it was an injustice. They demanded an immediate rematch, the organization. <laughs> you know, all it's that. funny how all that, that happens when the A side that, feels yeah, like Yeah, right? All that, all that jazz, right? All that jazz, yeah. baby. So, so now, what do you think? You think the judges aren't going to be influenced or affected or aware of that? Where of they're going to know that the light's on them and they're going to say, oh, my God. Oh, I better make sure that I, you know, here, let me make my card out now. Let me just make sure I don't make a mistake. Okay, hold exactly. on. Exactly. Oh, hold on. First That's round. exactly right. Oshaki. Second round, Oshaki. Third round, Oshaki. <laughs> you got to throw round, one Oshaki. or two in for oh, uh, Okay, fifth Kinsei round, so. Kinseiko. Um, I think I could give him one, you know. Uh, but at the end of the day, yeah, I think he's got everything going for him. I think I explained it. I think I broke it down uh, for me the way that it needed to be broken down. And on top of it, like I said, the cherry on top of the ice cream sundae, if that's not enough going for Forster, I think he's got the pressure on the, on the judges where they're going to be afraid not to give it to him. Yep, I think you're right. Well, that's a very thorough breakdown of all the action from last week and a good preview of an upcoming fight. Um, you got anything else, Ted, before we say goodbye? No, go Yankees. i say it again. Go Yankees. Go Yankees. Uh, I, look, the New York, New York Giants football playing tonight, but my God, come on. What are they playing for? What are they playing? Draft <laughs> picks already? <laughs> Sam's left. I'll tell you what. Sam. Did you see the kid from... Um, uh, Indianapolis Colts, uh, Richardson, I think, the quarterback with the last uh, minute of the game. He, it, some of oh, the decision-making. Wow. Pat McAfee was like, went on a tirade and was like, I've never seen a quarterback mail it in or tap out of a game. So, obviously, he like stayed in bounds when he could have got in in bounds. It's when he could have went out, it was a crazy finish to the game. If you haven't seen that, it's worth Which game? At. Which game was that? Indianapolis Colts, the quarterback Richardson. He, there's less than a minute left, and he runs. I thought the you were going to talk is, about. Uh, I thought you were going to talk about the Bears and the Commanders. Oh my uh, God! If there wasn't, a, if there's not a lesson there for high school kids, just play the game and stone act like an idiot. One of the Bears guys was taunting the opposing fans. He was not paying attention. The ball was snapped. He wasn't even in the play. He ended up getting over in the play on the Hail Mary, but the quarterback for Washington launched like a 70-yard pass in the air, tipped right into the back of the end zone where a guy from Washington caught it for the win. Unbelievable Hail Mary. One of the best you'll ever see, but the real story there was one of the Bears' defensive backs clowning around and taunting instead of playing and, you know, arguably could have cost them the game. Yeah, definitely. Not not a good moment. Not a good moment if uh, you bet the other way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, probably not. <laughs> you didn't. Uh, they'd be saying to you right now, Ken, f you in your teaching moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Take your teaching. <laughs> take your teaching moment, and you know what with yeah, it, Ken? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They they are. They were not. Their people are not happy. But um, this was a good one, Ted. Thanks for everything. Um, guys, thanks for being with us. We'll see you back here next week. Same time, same location. If you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe and have a great week, everyone. Boom. Oh.